I'm John Travis in Novato, California on October 8th, 2021, talking to Betsy and David Poist in Charlottesville out there on the East Coast. And why I've uh, so much wanted to interview you is that you played such a pivotal role in my getting into wellness in the first place. What, 51 years ago that we met, uh, came to uh, Baltimore to do my residency in preventive medicine. We were living in, a, in an old house on Old Court Road, and, and we heard from the neighbors about this Koinonia place that it was a nudist colony, and it was really weird. <laughs> I said, <laughs> got to check that place out, and found out that it was, a, we didn't even have the term new age in those days, but we started coming out to meditations and I'd done TM, uh, I've been introduced to TM and didn't think much of it in the snake oil lecture that I heard. Mm -hmm. But we met Dick uh, and started coming to the meditations and uh, wound up living there. And <clears throat> in a crucial time in my uh, residency training in preventing medicine, when I found the book High Level Wellness, and Koinonia probably had more to do with what I eventually did than any of my professional training. Wow. And uh, it was your brainchild. So I'm delighted to, first of all, find out who you are and why, and then we'll talk some about how it came to be and, and what your motivations were. So I'd like to start with your, your childhood influences. And let's start with you, Betsy, of where you were born, siblings, parents, uh, what kind of influences led you to your path? Uh, I was born in Richmond, Virginia. Um, my parents, um, John Page and Betty Williams, um, were absolutely wonderful people. Um, got really, really lucky in that score. Um, he uh, was an Episcopal priest, uh, but had always done education. Um, a man of great distinction in many, many ways. My mother was also a very, very fine person. She was a homemaker taking care of my brother and me uh, and also taking care of the rest of her family. Um, her mother, her widowed mother and uh, her uh, brother and her sister were all very much part of our lives. My, um, on the one side, my brother who's two and a half years older than I am were the only two grandchildren. And on my father's side, we were two of 25 grandchildren. Ah. Both sets of grandparents lived very near us, um, and so a very strong influence of family in that early time. Mm. Also, um, very lucky in the schooling that I had. And how are things with your brother? Uh, things are good with my brother. Um, as we were growing up, um, the little sister to a two and a half year old brother, there was a bit of going back and forth. <laughs> I think I gave as good as I got. Um, <laughs> uh, then as we got to be um, more, I'd say, older teenage and college age, um, we got uh, a good bit closer um, and then have had different times when we have not seen as much of one another. We are even now going to his birthday party tomorrow night. So wow. um, all good. Oh, where is he? He lives in Richmond. Oh, OK did live in Annapolis, uh, and he's a naturalist who worked for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation for ah. 47 years and did great work there. And now you went to school, I'm trying to remember, uh, you're a Smithy? Smith, Smith, yeah. Yeah, and uh, high school in Richmond or? Uh... High school in Richmond, and part of my father's work involved uh, seven uh, schools that were related to the Episcopal Church. and. It was not a heavy religious indoctrination, but it was a sense that when there was a moral and spiritual dimension to education, that it could really enhance the lives of students and contribute mm. to the community. And it was a private school that I went to, uh, but I went to uh, for free because of my father's work. Uh, he had been the headmaster of the brother school. That's where I was born and had early years. Uh, and then he became the, like the superintendent of these seven schools related to the Episcopal Church. Interesting. All around Richmond? Uh, no, all around Virginia. All uh -huh. around part of Virginia anyway. Uh -huh. yeah. And then Smith College, which was a great experience for me. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll come back and pick that up probably and uh, how you two met. But let's pop over to David and where you were born and 
or influences and all that? Well, I can tell you in terms of where we met, uh, we'll start with that. Uh, I was going a degree at Johns Hopkins in uh, liberal arts and Betsy uh, joined the class I was taking on the crisis in belief. And that's where we began our dating. Oh. And we became real. We were each dating other people, actually. <laughs> so we became very, very good friends before we ever evolved into something more. So you so, you left uh, after you graduated from Smith. You came to Hopkins, or uh, I, I no. I, well, I was taking some courses at Hopkins, but I uh, I came to Baltimore to teach. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. So David, where were you born and uh, all that? I was born in Baltimore uh, 81 years ago this month. Um, uh, my parents, um, uh, my mother was a school teacher. My father was a, a office manager. Uh, it's an old uh, middle-class Baltimore family. Uh, had been there for a long time. Uh, I have one brother, Malcolm, who is 83 and has moderate dementia. He and I are quite different. He's always been very much of a loner. Um, and um, I've always, I guess, been drawn to more corporate communal aspects. Uh, went to uh, William and Mary College and then to Berkeley Divinity School, uh, which is affiliated with Yale Divinity School. Episcopal Seminary, and then did this Master of Liberal Arts at, uh, at Johns Hopkins. And what, where in Baltimore did you grow up? Because I, I got to know Baltimore, of course, living there. I, I grew up in the county in Catonsville. Catonsville, okay. Yeah, I, uh, I got kind of famous with the draft uh, card burning that yep. later on. I yeah, did, in fact. My, my draft card was probably covered with blood. Oh, well, um, when, when the the Kingsville Nine poured on the falls. Oh, really? Okay. Yep. And also, the uh, brothers. just on the subject of Kate and Soul, isn't that where uh, the um, uh, who were the the um, Catholic brothers? Were they monks uh, that were well known? The for Berrigan the, brothers. Yes. Yeah. They the were. Were they Kate and they're the ones who poured the blood? They were the they're ones. The, okay. They're the ones who poured the blood on my my draft card. Because uh, one of my colleagues at at uh, Public Health Service Hospital, Faith Gilman Gill something, uh, lived in the same house as them. She was a, uh, a recovering nun, and I I uh -huh. just learned about it a little bit through her. So uh, small world. So then uh, we're up to your, <clears throat> your meeting each other, um, friends at Hopkins. And this would have been what, uh, about 70, late 60s, early 70s? 68. Ah, the summer of love. But you were doing it in Baltimore. <laughs> there you go. So um, you were dating other people and then uh, something happened and here you are. That's right. And still friends. Well, good. And uh, say a little more about how how your relationship involved and and, and your interests. And, and uh, coincidentally, that David happens to be an Episcopal priest, or not so coincidentally. Right, John, <laughs> well, John, an interesting thing. Well, we actually met at Old St. Paul's Church in Baltimore, where I was on the staff, oh. and Betsy came to church there. And so one of the many cousins came with me and introduced me to David. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's the way people in the olden days used to be that way. Uh, yeah. Very uh, it's a different world today. And now is that the church where the Desiderato supposedly was found? Right. Well, yes. Good yeah. for you. Yeah. I don't know whether that's urban legend or whether it was true, but they always credited it with that church. A little, little bit of, little bit yeah. of each. Yeah. But John, you'd be interested that we met and we got married in 1970. And we, we were approaching our wedding, which ended up being a pretty large affair in Richmond, 
uh, and at the same time negotiating our move uh, to Koinonia community where I was chosen by the board to be the director. And um, so anyway, we got married and we went off and bought a Volvo station wagon in uh, uh, Amsterdam <laughs> and we got an air mattress and we slept in the back of the, the, uh, the station wagon for nine weeks. We traveled uh, several mi thousand miles all over Europe. Then we came back and there we were plunk right in the middle oh, of Koinonia. <laughs> and Sarah and I did the same thing. We picked up a Navy Blue 1970 Volvo station wagon in Amsterdam. That's right. That's but we only right. had two weeks because I was in between my uh, internship and my residency. And did you sleep in it? No, we didn't. Uh, I later I slept in uh, I remember that. I've spent a lot of time sleeping in the back. In fact, I have a 2004 that I can sleep in the back of now. Yeah. You, would, you wouldn't fit in the back of a Volvo. I have to have the tailgate open a crack. Yeah. Right. yeah but it's still it's still doable. Yeah. 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 So I had realized that you had gotten married just right before we met you because it was September of 70 when we wow. first started coming out there. We arrived in July, I think it was. And um, uh, now I understood you were also a, a, a chaplain or pastoral counselor at Hopkins prior to that. No, I was I was a chaplain at the Peabody Institute and the Maryland Institute of Art. Oh. Uh, and uh, in fact, I was reflecting. <clears throat> I see my uh, uh, my ministry was in three phases. The first part actually before I met Betsy, I was a campus minister at a little college out in um, Westminster, Maryland, uh, uh, Western Maryland College. And I helped, I created a, a coffee house there. And then I also took on these Baltimore schools as a campus minister and opened up a coffee house there uh, with a, uh, working with a rabbi and some Jesuit priests and, um, and, uh, meeting all kinds of interesting urban folk. And a former nun. And a former and a nun, Methodist. that's yeah. right, a Methodist minister. But so my first phase professionally was I was sort of a campus minister and one person called me a beatnik with a collar. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then the next phase was the almost seven years at Koinonia uh, in that role. And then the last 29 years of uh, active professional ministry. I was the rector and uh, chaplain at the University of Virginia, rector of the church there. Now, is the church, uh, what's the connection with uh, UVA? I know it's right across from the rotunda. Uh, is there a, an official connection or just proximity? And there, there are lots of connections going way back. The rector there uh, administers a, an endowed scholarship and so forth, but there is no organic connection. Uh, uh -huh. I guess that my main connection was, I was rector of the church and at the same time, uh, an Episcopal chaplain to the students. Uh -huh. And lots of um, faculty, staff, students, as uh -huh. well as people, local uh -huh. community as well. But the, the university is a very strong presence in the church. Yeah. And it was interestingly, the church was having a, an interfaith service the night before the awful events of Charlottesville uh, when the torches came across the lawn of the University of Virginia. Uh, we happened to be away, far away, or we probably would have been right there. Um, and the church was surrounded. The service came to an end and the police came in and said, you can't leave because the torches were all around the church. Oh, I didn't realize it was out there. I thought there it was downtown. After David had retired, that yeah. was. Yeah. Uh, way after I retired. Uh, Jack, <clears throat> you'll get a kick out of this. Uh, after almost seven years at, um, at Koinonia, where we, we, we say we left our youth or we spent our youth. But we youth, learned a lot. Learned a lot and learned grew a up. a whole lot. Uh, but when I went to uh, St. Paul's Memorial Church in Charlottesville, I uh, would say to some of my closest friends, I said, uh, after uh, almost seven years at Quinonia, anything 
was going to be a piece of cake. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> In terms of all of the dynamics and people and complexities and challenges. Right. I know having lived in five intentional and one unintentional communities, uh, Koinonia yeah. being the first, uh, it was uh, uh, typical of, uh, well, Shannon Farm, just to south of you where yeah. I lived for uh, four years, was probably the most organized, but they had been through all kinds of turmoil. It wasn't until they found uh, formal consensus by, uh, what's his name, um, uh, from Boston, who formalized a method of consensus that they were able to sort through the, the chaos that <laughs> living in community in a culture that is, has lost its sense of village and community, uh, yeah. the challenges that we have. But let's go back to uh, 1970 and, and you, uh, you got married, you traveled Europe and you came back to uh, uh, Koinonia. What, what months did you get there then? It must have been about August or? Got there. I think we got there uh, officially. I think I began September the first. Wow! I I had no idea that you were that new when I when I came out there. Um, trying to think, what was the the woman's name that that was doing the TA? She did a TA workshop and um, tall blondish woman. Um, we came to one of her workshops there. Do you remember? I, I could look her name music, up. It wasn't music and consciousness. No, I, transactional analysis. Yeah. She come from somewhere else, and you probably would remember her name before we would. I have it written down in my database, but she lived on the uh, northeast part of Baltimore, I remember. Wow. I followed her for some years. Uh -huh. uh, but, uh, you know, that was simultaneously... <clears throat> It was transactional analysis and Koinonia and Hopkins and public health service and the book High Level Wellness, all that just rolled into one. Rolled into one, yes. So uh, I rem I'm trying to think of Dick's last name, Richard. Uh, Falkenstein. Yes, Falkenstein, because he was probably our age. <laughs> he seemed right. like an old man. <laughs> That's right. You're right. I hadn't thought about that. Well, he, he died in his 90s, so we've got a little, little time to go. Yeah, yeah. When, when we knew him. When we was knew him, he was in his 70s. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's right. And uh, we were in our 30s or late 20s. <laughs> that's right. So uh, I remember he was the first really strong connection. We'd get up at sunrise and drive out there and sit in the in the living room and the sun would come up behind us through the trees and this was my first wife sarah and i who you you know well and um it just it was uh grew and grew on us to the point where then we got pregnant and thought well where would be a great place to have a child and arranged to move there and uh got that apartment upstairs in the uh the old Memorial House. Memorial. Yeah, yeah, and uh, right across from you in the in the uh, parsonage, as it were. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and we shared babies. We yeah. Shared babies. Not only did we have the same cars, we had kids at the same time. <laughs> uh, when was Chad? What's Chad's birthday? Chad's birthday is May nineteenth, and Hannah is February seventh. Yeah. February 7th. Yeah. Yes, right. So just that. And jumping ahead a little bit, because that, uh, uh, but on the subject of babies, we were having dinner at your house. Uh, ah, yes. On February yes. 7th. That's right. And That's right. We served hot fudge Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> I love this story. <laughs> and her water broke. Yep. And uh, <laughs> we had to finish the hot fudge Sundays. <laughs> And then we hopped in the Volvo Love and that. drove at breakneck speed down the, JF, the Jones Falls Expressway yep. to Church Home Hospital, where we had arranged for me to be in the delivery room and yep. two hour labor and, and we had Hana. Yep. So yep. Uh, that, was, that was rather exciting, but backing but, up a little bit more to the story. The only, only hospital where we could do it the way we wanted to do it. We so you, you went there too? We went there too, yep. And, and now, David, where were you born? At home or in a hospital in Baltimore? I was born at uh, Union Memorial Hospital. 
Uh -huh. It was across from Johns Hopkins uh, uh, Homewood. All right. Is that still functioning or did that get swallowed I up? Or? So. I think it's still a, a, a neighborhood uh, uh, urban, as far as I know it is. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then the old public health service hospital that was on the other side of Homewood campus, where I was, uh, that got converted into a, a community hospital. If it's still functioning, I don't know whether it is or not. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, so we, we um, moved to Koinonia and uh, uh, all of these amazing people that you brought in, uh, some of the, you know, I, I was still pretty straight arrow, you know, out of medical school, conventional public health service, hospital training. I had been uh, exposed to TM on in April of 70 with a patient who came in for a hernia postal employee named Alex Green. And um, when I went, I was on call that night and we do our workups after hours. And I asked, you know, where is, where is he? Oh, he's meditating. I said, what? You know, you only do that in church. And uh, so they fetched him and we went in a little room and I did the, uh, you know, history and physical. And then he showed me a paper by, um, um, I think of his name in a minute, um, guy uh, that, that did, was doing TM research, uh, blanking on his name at, at Harvard, where I just, you know, done my medical training in Boston, showing blood pressure lowering with transcendental, well, he didn't call it that, but that was his, um, I'll think of his name in a minute. <laughs> He's the, Herb Benson, Herbert uh -huh. Benson. And uh, it blew my mind. I thought this, what, what, you know, this mind body was unknown. Psychosomatic was a bad term. Oh, it's psychosomatic, it's all in your head. You know, that was the, the uh, wisdom of the day. And I got so interested, I started uh, spending time with another intern who was a classic hippie with the old VW bus. And uh, uh, I had avoided him because he was so weird up to then. <laughs> but I discovered he knew Ram Dass, the Be Here Now was still in the, the big binder with the LP record. It hadn't been soft cover yet. I got that right after we got to Baltimore. And I had all of this sort of teasing of these things but it wasn't until I got to Koinonia that I met these people. You were bringing people in from California. Uh, you had, uh, what's their names from um, Findhorn? Yeah, yeah. And it was uh, like, wow, just boom, boom, boom. The caddies and eventually Ram Das himself. Oh, did, I missed that. He came after I left, I guess. That was, huh. a, that was one of the high points of our time there because I think we had over 300 people and we were making all kinds of soybean casseroles all night long to feed all these meditating vegetarians. Making uh, wild basil to make tea and making, oh, it just, it was wild. It was just wild. I didn't know that. So. Yes, and he was wonderful. He was. He, he, was had just to, great. he, he mainly spoke outside. We couldn't get every, we didn't have yeah. to out there in that great big, big open space, the circle. That's yeah, I, I use photographs of that in my slideshow and the uh, uh, Eric and Julie sitting in the, uh, yeah, the yeah. rocking uh, bench that uh, yeah, the guy right. made with his chainsaw. That's right. And, uh, yeah, it's classic. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I didn't, I didn't realize that. I didn't run into him until uh, my second daughter, 21 years later, we took... Uh, Sienna to uh, the um, Mendocino High School where he was speaking and she was like a few weeks old and at one point she made some baby sounds and he said something from the stage about well even she gets it or something like that so that's good but that was, Jack we even had uh, uh, Ram Das's teacher who was named Bhagavan Das uh -huh. uh, do you want a funny story yeah well, he uh, he was much younger than Ron Doss and very, very tall and thin and uh, I think maybe long blonde hair. And he was speaking over in the uh, carriage house. Uh -huh. uh, they didn't have as big a crowd for him. There may have been 75 people or something. But 
uh, there were lots of cars there and he hadn't gotten there and uh, I was late getting over there. I had to do some other stuff in the office, I guess. And so I got, uh, I was just leaving to walk over the circle to get to the carriage house. And all of a sudden this big old finned white Cadillac pulled up and zoomed into the parking lot, leaving dust behind it and uh, uh, jammed on the brake. And out of one side came this guy and out the other side came a, a woman all dressed in a white robe and they were hollering and screaming at each other. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is really gonna be quite an evening. I wonder who they are. And so I had to do, I had to go back to the house for something. And so five minutes later, I got into the room and of course everybody was in silence. And there was the guy who was driving the car, you know, sitting there doing alm and uh, uh, with his with his palms opened up. <laughs> <laughs> he needed it. Yeah. He I, needed it. You know, That's what you need to I, learn. <laughs> yeah. You need to learn. Yes. I saw a great interview with Terrence Rial, uh, who does a lot of men's work, and he said he'd come back from being on the road doing all this peace and love stuff, and then his house would erupt into conflict. <laughs> <laughs> how, uh, how hard it was to practice what you preach. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, uh, uh, things that I missed, because I was only there about three years, I think. Uh, and we moved out to Columbia and uh, uh, but just reminiscing a few of the other events, uh, uh, the people like that you'd attracted. I remember uh, Steve and Betsy uh, were uh, classic. They fell in love. Um, and then Eric and Julie, the cook, and I visited them. In fact, I, I mean to, meant to track them down there last I knew in Madison, Wisconsin. And, um, and one of the events I remember was uh, an Easter egg drop off the uh, off the fire escape <laughs> on the third floor. Whose idea was that? Was that yours, David, or did Julie? No, think? it was. Um, oh, what's her name? Beth. Oh, yeah, Beth Prager. Oh, it was Beth Prager's idea. But we, it's interesting. It'll be interesting. A little footnote: we we took the idea with us back on to Charlottesville. And we would drop, we'll have egg drops from the big tower of the church. The steeple. Oh. <laughs> and the more STEM um, background, um, people who made the, because uh, often faculty would be involved making their own egg drops, the worse, the more disastrous the eggs were. Yeah. <laughs> well, what I remember is the only one that survived was Julie sticking it into a chicken. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> a, a crochet. Oh, a lie. A, a dead chicken. Yeah. Yeah, dead chicken. Yeah. And then another time she crocheted a chicken, and I think maybe oh. that was survived too. But you're absolutely right. She stuck it inside that chicken. My goodness. Yes. And Eric, the physicist, I think he built an elaborate framework with rubber bands and you know suspension system and a big ball. Yeah. <laughs> the scientists who go went who would go bust would have a, a hard ego time. <laughs> they had put more into it than most, uh, most of the artists. I'm glad to know that tradition survived because that's one of the memorable moments. Yeah. That, uh, sure. and what was interesting though, in, in terms of the people, um, there were these hippies that I don't know where you got them from. <laughs> uh, Ott and uh, uh, who was, uh, yeah. there was well, some of the other. Actually, I think Otz had gotten a, a master's degree in English Hopkins. at Hopkins. Yeah. He a teacher, I think. Yeah. I think he was a burnt out school teacher. Well, now, did you recruit them from Hopkins or how did, how did they find them? They yeah. just, they just came from the clouds. I mean, never, <laughs> we, we got a lot of publicity. We were on television and in the newspapers. Oh, okay. Yeah. We, you know, we had these first Sunday afternoon open houses and, you know, would have, you know, 50, 60 people come. Uh, and then we did large events. We had a big Yule log hunt and that got coverage and people would come out to that. And a couple of times we had snow and it was just glorious. Uh, but um, I, I don't, I, well, it was that time after the 60s People were kind of exhausted, and 
the extroversion, the activism of the 60s began, you know, turned inward and, uh, you know, people went to the country, people went to the mountains to try to reflect on everything that had happened from Kennedy's death to Martin Luther King's assassination yeah. to the, the Vietnam War. Everybody was really burnt out. And we even had a, 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 pro, a, a program in January called uh, Dropout. And it was uh, uh, oriented towards sort of college students who had a January term who were tired of academics and wanted to drop out for a month. Well, if it only a month, I thought it was longer. I, I was there for that first one. Uh, we had classes in organic gardening and meditation and yoga. Well, we, we, did have, we had a fall and a spring term like, uh -huh. but we also created the dropout, which was a takeoff, of course, on the 60s dropout and turn on. Uh huh. Yeah. Tune in, yeah. A lot of people of all ages, but especially young, were very disenchanted with institutionalized education yeah. institutionalized religion, religion so, yeah. yeah well i remember the one where a, a large group of them were from a school in southern pennsylvania uh, yeah elizabeth town. town college yeah, yeah. Uh, that was it there was yeah. a, a great professor who would send them there and they would get credit for their whole semester being mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah i remember being a part of that and uh, yeah. Of course, I was going off to uh, my residency every day, yeah, uh, five days a week, and uh, pretending to be a public health service commissioned officer, and yes, right. finishing my master's in public health. Yeah. Um, so I was uh, living this dual life. Yeah, and for sure. uh, it was it was interesting. Dick was really central to so much um, and also a very strong draw for all kinds of people. Not only had he been meditating for 50 years, but he had, oh, a Quaker, um, but he also had been a vegetarian for 50 years mm -hmm. and he had been gardening organically for 50 years. And so the garden and Dick um, was a very, he was a very important part of a lot that, that set the tone there. And people like and Eric. Uh, Eric and what was the other guy's name? Uh, another uh, Eric and another guy were both Hopkins students, and they would, you know, get up um, at six in the morning to get out to Quinnia to meditate. Just with, like you all did. Just like you. Yeah. And in fact, Eric used to laugh at himself because he would get himself up at six o'clock and get out to uh, meditate with Dick, and he said he oftentimes just fell asleep. Uh, <laughs> Well, the thing I, I most remember about Dick was his experiment in the kitchen of putting out a jar lid of whole wheat flour and white flour yeah, and letting it sit for a week. And the white flour was untouched. The whole yeah. wheat flour was covered with warm. Oh. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That, yes. that was so. Uh, yeah. And then I remember uh, Steve. I, what's Steve's last name? The maintenance Steve guy. Bell. Bell. Saying, yeah, Steve Bell saying, as we're walking, because uh, the other thing that, that viewers may not know is we had a communal kitchen uh, and we'd share meals together, which was a, a, the most wonderful part of it, I think, is sharing meals. Yeah. But uh, Steve would mutter under his breath, oh, I see they're putting dead animals in the food again. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, that it wasn't vegetarian. It wasn't vegetarian, dead yeah. animals. I gotcha. Uh, not roadkill, but dead animals. Oh. <laughs> Yes, but well, that and not a whole lot. There was a lot of lot of soybeans. Yeah, well, yeah. That, that over our time, that was a ongoing struggle between the carnivorous ones and the vegetarians. Right. And we had a cook, Robin. I don't think I think you all had moved on. Yeah, it was Ella and uh, James were the cooks when I was there. Well, I know Lou Berry, and El and Ella, and but then came Robin, who was absolutely charming, um, but was had he was slide not saying how strongly macrobiotic he was. Right. And oh. so we uh, everything had to be yin and yang. And uh, some of the combinations were truly extraordinary. That's right. And Robin <laughs> didn't know Robin didn't know how to cook, actually. He had never <laughs> cooked. It was all in his head. his head. And so somebody said, 
if you went into the to eat, you never knew whether you were going to have green mush or brown mush or gray mush. And so <laughs> It. So he didn't know how to make it attractive. And to once us. to help balance the budget and pay the bills, we would rent the facility to outside groups, you know, mainly nonprofits or churches or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we had a a, a, a a black congregation, I think from down uh, inner city Baltimore, uh, that came out to have a weekend retreat there. And I had to sit Robin down and I said, now, Robin, I know about your macrobiotic commitments. I said, but I order you to produce meatloaf and mashed potatoes. And so I, I <laughs> he, so he was beautiful. And so the day that they came, of course, they came with all kinds of great big cakes and desserts, but he faithfully made uh, meatloaf and mashed potatoes with gravy. <laughs> and then there was a green dish that could have looked like, you know, um, kale, uh, or kale or something. And it was seaweed. And the, the congregants, the congregants, you know, tasted and said, what is this? <laughs> so actually, that story and so many aspects of Koinonia, and especially for David in the role he was in, was balancing lots of different points of view. Uh, well, and, and yeah. even with the staff, because I, uh, for our, our viewers, the background, Koinonia, well, it dated from the 40s, didn't it? Uh, uh, um, 50. 51. 51. And the, what's yeah. the name of the group, the Frank Laubach group? Uh, um, Laubach Literacy was, yeah. but yeah. It, was, it was called the, the, the 12 Men of Prayer. Only if there were women too. Well, uh, Louise, uh, Louise Eggleston yeah. came in later, but originally it was 12 men who would come together and pray on New Year's Eve into New Year's Day for the peace of the world after World War II. And the book called The Ugly American had just come out because so many Americans were going to try to serve in foreign countries. And when they felt um, alone and out of place and, and didn't know how to cope, they would react in, in very difficult kinds of ways. And so the way it started was as a training ground for people who were going overseas in whichever way they were. Uh, there were even some government people to learn languages and skills, but also to develop a centeredness so that when that happened to them, they could respond positively and mm -hmm. in the way that they intended instead of reacting and um, uh, pushing people away. And uh, the Peace Corps actually came to Koinonia to get some ideas for its early training because they had been doing this kind of thing for a while. Interesting. And so that, that centeredness continued to be an important part of what it was all about because the people who were going overseas basically stopped coming and lots and lots of young people started turning up. Right. And we, so that was the juncture when we ended up coming well, in. They still had a uh, in-residence uh, law bulk literacy teacher and she uh, did workshops at Koinonia and lived at Koinonia, but then she moved on. <clears throat> and there also, before we got there, there were classic missionaries who would come home, church missionaries would come home for a respite and while we were there, we had a couple yeah. of lovely I families. remember, yeah, the doctor and his wife, they were yeah. downstairs uh, from oh, Africa. That's right. They right. were great. Yeah. 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 Um, but the, the big, the, the real phenomenon was the Peace Corps was taking people and doing their thing. And there was lots of international uh, 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 good works. But for some reason, this combination of getting away from the city, um, the exhaustion of the 1960s, this place that had been in existence since 51, you know, with an almost a guru who was an organic gardener, a, a meditator, a teacher of meditation, a teacher of this Bible and sacred scripture. That, that had a lot to do with drawing the um, uh, drawing. And that's why we, I mean, we had everything from <clears throat> uh, TM folk uh, to TA folk to um, uh, uh, Hare Krishna. 
uh, to Jesus people. Um, and uh, uh, it was an extraordinary uh, mixture of the religious movements of the 60s and 70s. Yeah, it was uh, amazing because besides this, these hippies my age that were exposing me to whole different lifestyles, there was Marion and Jane and of course, had Dick been there from the start or how long, when did he arrive? He had, Mar Marion and Helen also had been there yeah. from the start. He had, I think 1951, Dick had. Yeah. Marion had been a medical missionary. Yeah. Uh huh. She was the nurse and, uh, um, yeah. she was the nurse. and I remember you told a story about her uh, when we saw you last summer that she was away when something happened. <laughs> No, there was a, a human potential group uh, came and they were really a nice, it was another rental so we could pay the bills <clears throat> and they wanted to use the big house and the living room and all where everybody would meditate and, uh, uh, and they seemed really like it was, you know, uh, a, a good group and everything was going fine. <clears throat> and uh, on Saturday morning, somebody came over rapping on the door and said, the whole group is stark naked in the swimming pool. Oh, well, that was it. <laughs> and I, I immediately thought of of uh, of Marion because she was very pious and very very devout Christian. Very dear though. Dear, yes. very, dear. very practical, but pious. And uh, and I immediately thought of her and thought, how am I going to work this out? <laughs> so I rushed. I rushed over to the main house and went upstairs and I went to her door and there was a big sign that said, Marion will be away for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so for uh, that little juncture, it fulfilled your image of it from the very beginning. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, our neighbors Images. that told us about it. Um, yeah. And I still remember David uh, up on a ladder hanging the signs that somebody made. We had these great signs of, put one at each, each entrance and um, you know, green. green letters on a white background. Yeah. Um, yes. And uh, yes. fastening it to the tree limb that we did. <laughs> so yeah, I can see that. I can well, see that. Um, I, I hope viewers are getting an idea of this rich environment that was so influential in my early career as I was transitioning out of sick care into what am I going to do? Because <laughs> public health sure wasn't it. And preventive medicine at Hopkins wasn't preventive, it was early detection. And then finding the right. book High Level Wellness, thinking wellness was a silly word and it would never catch on, but the concepts, you know. Jack, uh, yeah. Jack tell us some more about what it, the things that particularly affected you there, because uh, it's been really interesting to learn how important it was for you. Well, the people that we mentioned, and also who was the other uh, Finthorn guy that uh, the American uh, that uh, Lyle, uh, Peter, and um, Eileen Caddy, yeah. and then there was a younger couple named Lyle, Lyle Schnod. and Schnod and um. Uh, no, there's Schnod. another a single guy. He's he's made quite a reputation for himself since then. I'm trying to think of his name. Oh, oh David Spangler. David Spangler. Spangler, David yeah. Spangler. Now he came Spangler. too, didn't yeah. he? Yes, he did. I yes, remember did. him. Yeah. So uh, it was the exposure to these people, and the exposure uh -huh. to the residents, both old and new, and. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> just the times. I mean, it was, for me, uh, uh, astrologically, it was my Saturn return, which led to giving birth, finding my career, you know, all of these yeah. changes, which I didn't put much stock into until later. And two of our staff were doing astrologic uh, or natal charts on problem clients that we had, and it explained any things better than anything else. <laughs> so it made me a, a believer in something going on here. But um, all of these things that uh, I remember, there was a doctor you brought in from California. I don't remember his name. <clears throat> a, a fairly straight looking guy. Uh, this would have been probably 70, 72. Uh, and I don't remember anything except here's a doctor that's 
talking about this wacky stuff. Uh, no. That that had an impact. No. And no. Uh, uh, there were just you know a, a never ending flow of uh, new ideas and. Uh, of course, the, the sense of community, <clears throat> which I'd grown up in a small town and uh, lost that sense of community, you know, of course, living in Boston. And I had some of it at Worcester when I was in college, but uh, we do things like uh, we went over to uh, the Baskin Robbins in Pikesville one night. Uh, who was the guy that uh, uh, Cherry Garcia? No, it wasn't Cherry Garcia. It was... Um, Jamoke Almond Fudge was the predecessor to Jerry Garcia. Yeah. And we we formed, a, a, I don't know if Otz or somebody else, we formed a line and he acted like a king. We opened the door and made this uh, <laughs> ceremonial line as, as he came into the store. <laughs> sounds like Jeffrey. Yeah, I, that sounds, yeah. Now, also there was a guy teaching yoga. Was that Jeffrey? Uh, no. No, that was, so. uh, what's his name? Oh. Tall guy. Oh, the guy who worked with Dick very closely. Yeah. Um, oh, what was Bill it? Broad? Yeah, yes. Bill Broad, yeah. Broad. And, uh, yeah. you know, that was my first exposure to yoga. Yeah. So, Bill Broad is now a science editor for the New York Times. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> but I think yeah. you're thinking of, no, I'm thinking of someone who um, was a good, good, uh, worked with very him. lean. We once, I think, for some crazy reason, we had we saw him in New York, and he had just, he was still into all of his yoga practices, oh, but he had just had a hamburger. That's right. Uh, um, Jeff, um, Jeff, his yeah. name was Jeff. <laughs> um, but he was a yeah. real close buddy of, of Dix and a practitioner of, of, of yoga more so yeah. than um uh than bill jeff, broad jeff star maybe star like buck or star like yeah there was yeah. a star yeah. something yeah. yeah it wasn't yeah. star buck but it was maybe. like that yeah so it was jeff like star yeah lovely yeah. guy yeah and i uh of course was in medical school when the summer of love happened and oh, missed right. out completely except i knew something yeah. funny was going on because my <laughs> senior year at 69, they threw out all the required courses in Tufts Medical and we had wow. total electives. And it uh, was wonderful. I got to do these research projects and it was all because the class of, of 70 yeah. behind us had uh -huh. done all kinds of actions. I don't know how they did it uh, yeah. and, and changed the school's whole curriculum. So I knew something was amiss or afoot. Yeah. And then I arrive in, in Mill Valley, uh, for my internship and i heard about uh hate ashbury and um mm -hmm. it still didn't i don't even know if the word hippie was well known at that point it was just becoming defined and uh i i missed all that but so koinonia was like a, a makeup class for me <laughs> getting oh, it Jack, the image of you coming and going in a day and going to a place of the head, basically, uh -huh. and then Koinonia, which was just wide open, all of the <laughs> being in your heart and all of that is is really, it must have been a little bit um, confusing, really, to move between those two settings. Well, it would put you, it would, it would put you on the quest to find uh, some kind of unity between yeah, the, there you the go. two worlds. There you go. Right. Well, and Halbert Dunn with High Level Wellness, this amazing book where he integrates the mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual. That's what drew me in. I thought wellness would never, was a silly word. And we had to spell it, you know, Dan Rather, when our 60 minute piece, he opens it saying, wellness, now there's a word you don't hear every day. And that was 79, you know, and it was, it was still true. But um, yeah, it, I don't remember it being painful uh, you know cognitive dissonance because i was unhappy with the uh, you know I'd, I'd done a boring year of the masters in public health classes uh we had a couple of interesting classes but uh, there was uh, one where we did an encounter group uh that was poorly run and turned into a, a squabble <laughs> woman just left us alone and uh, but i was very dissatisfied with that model so 
wasn't a whole lot of conflict. It was like, oh, wow, there's, there's another way. Oh. And yet it was that integration that uh, it all fell together. So the, uh, the coincidence of uh, not only our arriving at the same time, having the same cars, having kids at the same time, and, and uh, sharing all these interests uh, was yeah. uh, probably, the, probably the most important developmental yeah. phase in my whole career. And uh, I didn't fully appreciate it till some years later. But, um, yeah. Really great. Um, so I, I think uh, we probably covered most of Koinonia. Uh, your life since then has been a lot tamer, I gather, in Charlottesville. And uh, you have such a wonderful place. I loved seeing it last summer when we came out. And, great to have you overlooking the reservoir and uh, uh, now in retirement uh, though. Now, Betsy, you were uh, at FEI. That's how I found out uh, through my colleague, Kent. Uh, yeah, right. You were uh, teaching. Yeah, let's go back a little bit more with your, your career. You, uh, after Koinonia, what, uh, we know David was uh, running a church and right. were were what were you doing? I ended up having a um, really good way to be in a complementarity with his work, but to be separate. Um, mm -hmm. At the beginning, um, I was working with a program that was um, a, uh, an Episcopal seminary that set out an extension course. Uh, but anybody it took four years to go through it. And anybody who was studying it was meeting once a week in a seminar setting with a leader and I was such a leader and taking uh, the time together to integrate what they were learning with their heads with their lives, um, which in, enlivened the material and the material added wisdom to our perceptions and decisions in our lives. And uh, it was a, it was coin and ear prepared me for it in many ways because there was, it was very, very, very experiential. The seminars were and um, also a whole lot about group process that I had learned at Koinonia. And I did that for many years. Um, and then a friend of mine who had been one of the students- She, she traveled, all over, traveled all over the country, did, yeah. actually training oh, the leaders. leaders of this program. Yeah, yes. right. It was a national all program. Very experiential and I loved it. And one of the students had, had started in, Kentwood Nor, Bev Wan, had started in at uh, FEI and she said, you really ought to check this out. And what ended up happening, the part of FEI that I was involved with was small group work uh, and giving the people who had come there uh, from the government, from various uh, technical expertises, but all at the same level and moving up and needing to have a different kind of approach to leadership. Uh, a leadership that involved other people in a, um, a significant way that wasn't, you do this, this is what you need to do, this is what you have to do, this is what will happen to you if you don't do it, more uh, uh, the kind of thing that involved the resourcefulness and sense of responsibility of the people under them. And then all sorts of other things like Kent's work with wellness and, and those kinds of things. But I love that work, um, being with small groups of people uh, and um, it was great. It was really, really good. Both Kent and I were part-time, would have been called adjunct faculty. So I was not full-time and that meant I could do a lot of things in the church as well. So, um, and I was there 24 years and it was really- Wow, nice. and, and she got her training. She got her training at Koinonia. Uh, yeah. uh, yes. you know, uh, when she would rotate leading the Thursday night community That's meetings. Right. I mean, that was a real challenge with people coming from all directions. And Koinonia was seven years of an encounter group. So I learned a lot. <laughs> well, and, and for our viewers, FEI is a federal executive institute, which is a, 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 a kind of a Koinonia for federal executives. <laughs> in terms of, uh, to executive yeah. yeah, they'd come there for a month and, and uh, yeah. right. uh, I, did a couple of guest lectures with Kent and got to see it from the inside and yeah. what an experience for them. And I 
really, um, at that time anyway, a very beautiful um, community of a whole lot of trust, um, a whole yeah. lot of caring, a lot of nurture, uh, along with some significant um, training and um, study of the Constitution and all kinds of other uh, more intellectual features of, of mm -hmm. the work. But a, a very important uh, opportunity for people involved in the federal government uh, to come and be with others um, without having to watch their backs, but to mm -hmm. say someone, someone else whom they had gotten to know and trust, I'm really having a hard time. Have you got, can I talk to you about it? I mean, do you have any ideas for this thing that I'm going through? It's a great, it's a great place. It's in difficult leadership right now, but it was a wonderful yeah. place. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, uh, that's uh, pretty much it, I think, for your careers, but let's uh, touch into your family life because uh, you had Chad born uh, just a few months after Anna. And right. now I'm trying to remember this. You have a daughter too? We do. We have a daughter, Maggie, who was born. Chad was five when we left Koinonia. And uh, for a um, lot of his early life, I had been taking care of all the children at Koinonia, including Hana. Um, and Hannah, when after you all left, Hannah would come back as well. Um, and so there didn't seem to be any need for siblings. He had siblings. And uh -huh. so then Maggie was born after we came to Charlottesville. She resents the fact that she was not at Quinnia. So she's kind of living a hippie life now. She's, she has created a, um, a remarkable uh, sense of network and community yeah. in West Asheville, North Carolina. Oh, really? Huh. Right. That's a great community. I have a number of friends there and interesting. Um, she and her husband met at, as raft guides. Oh. Uh, she was an outward bound instructor for five years. And now both of them are teachers. Matt teaches high school and Maggie teaches English in the community college. And they have two children. Yeah. Well, oh. <clears throat> so uh, any grandkids? Yep. Four. Uh, Four, yep. Two in Asheville, and Chad lives in Los Angeles oh. um, with his wife, Bokyan, who is, uh, was born in South Korea, uh, moved to Portland, Oregon when she was just four, so very American. Um, and um, uh, they have two children, too. So, uh -huh. How old are the, are the grandkids? The grandkids are, um, Asheville is nine and six, and uh, LA is uh, six and three. So. Uh-huh. Yes, yeah, so so your two, Hannah's children, did you say 11 and 14? Yeah. And Chad's children, both of them born at the same time, Chad's children are three and six. Uh-huh. So he did a lot of things before he settled down to family life. He got That's married for the first and only time on his 40th birthday. That's right. And uh, uh, he'll this coming May, he will be 50. With a with a three a four year old. That's right. With a four year old. Yeah, I I gave birth or uh, my wife gave birth at age fifty with Sienna, so yeah. I know a little about being a geriatric father. <laughs> ah, yeah. for, for the grandfather. Chad uh, loves it. Chad really really loves it. Yeah, he's a happy I used to say that people shouldn't get married before thirty. That maybe you could have a starter husband, but you know, no kid. <laughs> so what's Chad doing now? Uh, Chad is a businessman. Uh, he and, and Bokyan are both in business, uh, and he does supply chain. So he's coping with all those he ships. Is right in the midst of Long Beach, where the oil spill is, and there are these hundreds of ships, cargo ships, out in the in the <clears throat> Pacific Ocean. They can't get in because there aren't enough uh, uh, drivers to unload the uh, unload the. Um, oh. Cargo. Cargo. Yeah. Um, oh, so he is he is right in the middle of it all. He's very cheerful and he loves, he's just an a incredibly positive person. He loves problem solving. He is a very good listener. And so he will listen to what people need and, and think things through in a very, very creative kind of way. So he's, he's doing good work. He went out to LA to act. And he got so far as to get a SAG card and all of that, but he had always said that whichever came first, a real acting job, and he did have small acting jobs, 
or uh, a real job period he would take and UPS was who he, he worked with for a number of years and that's what got him started and uh -huh. yeah so yeah well I uh, I want to acknowledge that uh, uh, the two of you have been together what 50 one years. Uh, what what was your wedding anniversary? What June? June twenty seventh. Yes. June twenty seventh. So, uh, and uh, I'm I stand in awe of, of people that uh, found their their partner so quickly because it. I love you. you from my it. dysfunctional family and uh, yeah. inability to uh, uh, see beyond the uh, the immediacy, uh, it's taken me a while to find my partner. <laughs> You have. You I have. have. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to have any kids together, but uh, anyway, it. Uh, but it was uh, great to be with you all and yeah, to we realize had a, we had a good time with. We loved it. Yeah. 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 So um, I it just goes to show. I think having um, parents who who created the loving environment and um, the uh, importance of of wellness beginning before birth and through yeah. birth. And, you know, they uh, say your uh, gifts come from your wounds and it's no accident I'm doing wellness, but yeah. uh, it's great to have a, a poster couple for, uh, for this project. Because yes. yes. many of the people I've interviewed have had similar uh, um, experiences of me of various uh, uh, failed relationships and struggles, but uh, the guys secret. are the best. A big secret is humor. Yeah, <laughs> lots, of, lots of laughs. Yep. Yes. Uh, uh, well, let me put a, a word about uh, daughter Maggie. She's a community college teacher, has 120 students. Um, you know, everything from really smart kids to um, uh, formerly incarcerated, former incarcerated drug dealers, drug and dealers, <laughs> and she's just done a fabulous job. Uh, and her the chair of her department, she teaches English, has just approached her and asked her come the spring term if she would take one of her classes to the women's penitentiary. Correctionals. Correctional oh, wow. facility. So yeah. she's gonna be- She's doing great, yeah, great work. Great work. Great work. And she and her family are all vegetarians. Well, especially Maggie and her daughter, Maple. And, um, 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 and the and the guys the too, guys but, too, but they they religious. like their meat on occasion. But Jack, one of the things in my time that I've learned is I I just I dislike all forms of fundamentalism, you know, be it uh, evangelical fundamentalism or Buddhist fundamentalism or Catholic fundamentalism, and I uh, I have such a crush on this little six-year-old maple but she is a vegetarian fundamentalist <laughs> she yes. lectures me on she does. eating meat and things like and that. she's been a vegetarian for the last three years and yeah. she has lectured all all those all three us, years yeah. all those three years yeah and she's yeah. six you said she's, she's six. six yeah she's six she's um uh, sienna my uh, now 28 year old is I refer to her as a vegan Nazi. Yes, um, I remember you telling us that. Uh, right. yeah. Very strongly held beliefs and, and a real struggle because she goes into these horrible uh, abattoirs and has locked herself up with other uh, wow. people and uh, been arrested and fined and Yikes. you know helped make the movies and uh, I, I'm just amazed at how she does it. Uh, yeah. depressing stuff to see what really goes on and yeah. enough to make you into a vegan. Yeah. Uh, but um, Absolutely. anyway, um, uh, she'll uh, uh, find her calling if she hasn't already. <laughs> right. yeah. Great to, uh, to know that. Any other um, uh, Areas that we didn't cover as we wrap up here. Final words for our viewers. Final words. Well, we, it all? We, we admire your good work. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I follow online. My online teacher is a Franciscan named Richard Rohr, R O H R, 
And his whole commitment is to create a spirituality of wholeness, of, of the coming together of the mind, the body, the spirit, the emotions. And uh, with an, a universal dimension. Yeah, univer he's a universalist, uh, remarkable. In fact, we, we've heard him and met him up at Chautauqua, where we go in the summertime. And there are always just all of these sort of wounded Catholics that are there. And they're always asking questions. How do you get away with uh, all that you say and do and be? And he's interesting because he says, he says, it's such a blessing to be a Franciscan because um, uh, they, uh, when, the, when Rome gets word to my uh, <clears throat> broad interpretation of the nature of things, uh, they always, uh, they go to the bishop and the bishop says, the local bishop says, well, you've got to talk to the Franciscan provincial. And the Franciscan provincial set all, uh, 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 regularly says, oh, uh, Father Richard, he's under my, under my uh, authority. And he's a wonderful man who says his prayers and works for all kinds of uh, uh, social action projects. And so he's been able to be a very <clears throat> inspiring, inclusive teacher uh, to million, millions of people probably. Uh, we heard him speak to 5,000 people at Chautauqua. Wow. Ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was great. Well, and speaking of Richard, we missed one of the central characters oh, at Koinonia, which yeah. was Richard and the coffee house. I didn't realize it was one of a series of coffee houses. That's right. Yeah. I still remember painting that room dark brown. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's right. And Richard was so important to David in seminary and so important to me. Well, and, and to, to Koinonia. Yes. Yeah, to everybody. Yeah. A, a shining talk about universal a wide open spirit yeah. and um, yeah. i don't know how i forgot him when we were back there covering the characters but right. he was I, uh, I spoke you know because he went on to be the uh, philosopher theologian in residence at the maryland institute of art and he was there for over 20 years and truly had a following of people who loved him and understood him the artists and had no clue that he had any relationship to yeah. any church yeah yeah but i i spoke at his um uh, at his um uh, memorial, memorial service and i said two things one a friend of uh, uh, fellow classmates said i don't know what uh, richard thought he was preparing us for but it certainly wasn't the church <laughs> <laughs> And the same friend in his maturity, in his 70s, finally came around and he said, you know, I, you, I remember saying that, and Richard wasn't preparing us for the church, Richard was preparing us for life. Yeah, yeah. And I also told the story at his memorial service of when he um, carried into the classroom, and he probably had had a little too much sherry before the class, uh, a bunch of uh, framed pictures of copies of uh, Georges Rouault, the, the French painter. And he talked about how Rouault always painted a level of gold paint. And then all of the heavy, deep colors, the maroons and the black, almost stained glass outline uh, of the leg, lead uh, <clears throat> had almost this darkness to it. But he allowed for his his he described he allowed for the gold to always show through, mm. and I I think I ended the sermon by saying that Richard was a person who uh, was very realistic about the dynamics of life between uh, uh, its uh, absurdity he would say on the one side and its uh, sustenance of some kind of greater mystery and that his genius was Richard always would find a way to tip the scales on the side of life being sustained by a greater mystery or love. Um, mm. uh, but I'm happy you gotten around to Richard because when yeah. you ask about favorite people, I think yeah, Betsy no, and I would right. both say in terms of favorite teachers, he was one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Top and, of the list. Uh, he he um, and Jane got together after. Yes, they did. Yeah, she and, uh, was very important to him at a particular juncture 
which led to this next chapter, yeah. which was she was the bridge thing. that got him to the Maryland Institute of mm -hmm. Art, where I think he reached really his fullness. Yeah, um, yeah. He had adored him. Yeah, there. yeah. Now, he, to me, he was the archetypal beatnik. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, yes. had been for a long time. Yeah. I'll to add, and I'm not going to be particularly articulate about this, but just thinking you have led us to be thinking back over many things and the sweep of life. And life has felt like it had a lot of that gold showing through and yeah. that there has been one thing after another that has unfolded, manifested itself, and that we have responded to those things. And it has been an incredible joy to be doing it with this guy. So. Um, and the, um, the richness and the fullness of family and of life and of experiences has been terrific. So, and a What a great summation yeah. for, uh, for our experience together. For sure. Thank for you, sure. Betsy. That's, uh, Thank you. Dad. I'm delighted. Uh, this, this exceeded my already high expectations for. <laughs> this has been a great pleasure for us too. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I'm going to end the recording and, uh,